there's always a big talk around self tape and getting back in the room and what that and what that's going to look like i think it opens up the doors for me in london to get talent from around the world we understand that it's a blessing and a curse but the reality is that it's we've opened pandora's box she's out um and we can't shove her back in and nor should we because of the opportunity but it means that recall stage will do in the room but the wider searches will be tapes and it allows us just to give opportunity and and a smaller you know an actor with less experience from a smaller agency is now getting those jobs because they've now had the opportunities to tape for these things and it's become a it, it's a bit of a leveler actually Hello, everybody. Welcome to the SAG After Foundations, the business program. I am casting director and board member of the CSA, Candida Cornejo. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, moderate and host this amazing uh, panel of RDOs, nominees, and honestly, legends to the casting community. Without further ado, it's a pleasure to introduce some of these legends and honestly some inspiration to me as a casting person. I actually looked up to a lot of these people um, as I grew before I even knew that I wanted to be a casting director. So it's a pleasure to have them here. We have Emily Trevor, Victor Jenkins, Denise Chamian, Tiffany Little Canfield. I always like to go around in the room and just kind of get this started and break the ice a little bit. So if we could go around and just tell me um, one, uh, what you love about casting, you know, why do you love your job? And then, you know, what are some of the, I guess, the background, some of the projects that you loved working on really quickly? What I love about casting is I really do feel that the process is a creative one. And what I love is to see the actor's growth during the process and also our growth on the creative team of a concept of what we thought, you know, as a character that's written on a page, as it becomes, you know, it, you know, as it becomes realized through the casting process, I'm always inspired by that. I always learn so much about all of the actors involved in the process. And um, that's what I'm here to do is learn. So I really love that. And in terms of projects, I mean, my very first project um, was uh, La Boheme on Broadway, which was the first opera I worked on. I had seen half an opera and I had the opportunity to work with um, Baz Luhrmann, who Denise, you're nominated for his amazing work in Elvis. In fact, I just tried to watch Moulin Rouge again with my kids uh, last night and they're still too young, I think, for any kind of romance. So Moulin Rouge was not for them <laughs> because of... Uh, feeling uncomfortable. Um, anyway, it was hilarious because they just can't take any kind of romance. But it's it was incredible experience and it um, inspired me. I didn't know casting was a job. And I was like, this is what I want to do. So I love that. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I will get to your guys' nominations and the project that you were nominated for. Um, right now, I'm just going to do like a like just a quick intro before we get into the, the juicy part of our conversation. Um, Miss Denise, hi there. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. It's nice to be here today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I think what I love about casting is, uh, well, number one, of course, the actors um, to see the actors bring the words to life in the room has always been exciting to be able to um, inform the roles maybe in, in a different way than the director may have seen them or the producers may have seen them is very satisfying when that happens. Um, and also to be able to shepherd and guide a lot of actors careers from the time that they're very young and you watch them you know grow and get older and more mature and you know turn into the movie stars that they become or you know the tv stars um and i think also i, I love giving people jobs that's fun we always get a thrill from that in our office 
when you know we can we can hire somebody who we have championed. Um, but the whole process is is very exciting, and I, too, I like being behind the scenes and. We kind of get to be in the beginning of any process and work very closely with a director. And then we send everybody on their way and we move on to the next thing. And I, I think I like that too. I love being able to slip in and out of different worlds with different directors um, and um, keep, keep learning also and moving forward. Uh, thank you so much, Denise. Mm -hmm. Some of the work that, um, uh, a quick story, um, when I moved to Los Angeles, um, I had made a list of my top five casting directors that I wanted to meet um, because I wanted to get into casting and one of them was Denise, uh, specifically Constantine was one of my favorite films. Oh. And so, and so, I and so, and actually, we wrote to you. I was in film school, you know, and you know, you kindly, I think, one of your assistants wrote back and actually walked us through the process um, on how to do it. But it was, it was just to hear that Denise wrote back to us or her office was amazing to me. So thank that's you. nice. Thank <laughs> you. I love that movie too. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Now, uh, Victor. Uh, do you mind um, coming in and telling us what you mm. love about casting and some of? Of course, yeah. kind of echoes the same um, as everyone. I think it's the creative process. It's being able to unlock something. I think when you get a script and you see some amazing people and someone comes in the room and they are the person, and it is an amazing feeling after doing longer searches, short searches. I think being able to curate something creative as well is really really nice um, and as a job as beginning middle and end you move on and that's quite nice as well um, I think as, as, as Denise said you, you kind of you have something is made you move on to the next thing and then in a year and a half time you see it and everyone's forgotten who you are but you can enjoy um, the, uh, the the finished product um, and in terms of in terms of uh, Credits. I always go back to probably one of our first films, which was Grabbers, which is a very, very silly Irish film about people on an island, off island, having to drink because the aliens that invaded the island are allergic to alcohol. It's a very stupid film. <laughs> Love it. And, you know, one of the most epic, extraordinary pieces that I've seen in my life was Troy and Alexander, and, and you worked on that. Correct. So. I did, yes, yeah. As I, my very first jobs in casting were, my first job in casting was to find someone who was shorter than Brad Pitt to be killed by Brad Pitt. That's insane. Yeah. That is so insane. Well, fantastic and phenomenal job, Victor. Thank you for being here. Um, and Miss Emily, Emily, you're responsible for doing some things that a lot of a lot of us know and understand. And I speak for my boyfriend, whose favorite video game is something that you worked on. And so... Uh, please introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about why you love casting and some of the work that you've done. What, which video game was it? Uh, it was called Goody, I believe, right? right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on it. Um, well, I agree with everything that, that everyone else said, and I also always wanted to meet Denise. So um, I think that it's just such a great career because... I think of it as an art form, but then there's a lot of work that we do alone. There's a lot of work we do collaborating with the team and we have to, you know, do searches and organize and negotiate. And it just, it involves so many different components. Um, it's kind of like putting together a puzzle. And so there's, I always have a feeling of kind of fear and excitement when I start something like, how is this possibly going to, you know, be just this script and then turn into something that we, we help create that's all going to fit together and work and, and help the filmmakers with their vision. I think that's very satisfying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. A huge congratulations to all of you for your nominations for the RDOs this year. It's been a wild, wild ride for all of us, if you like. You know, a lot of these films 
that um, you've been nominated for are pandemic movies, like a like a pandemic baby, um, so to speak, you know. But there was it was a huge learning curve for 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 a lot of us. But um, uh, Emily, um, huge congratulations on four samosas. Um, Victor, um, phenomenal job on the bubble. Uh, Denise, I think you did an extraordinary job on Elvis and also Top Gun. I mean, to such legendary pieces to do. And once again, you know, huge, yeah. huge beautiful job. Tiffany, your office was um, also nominated for The Same Storm. Uh, one of my personal favorites is the Only Murders in the Room as well. So I just want to say that you and Destiny are killing it as always about the office. But um, so let's get into some specifics here, um, if you guys don't mind. Um, Emily, very, you know, interesting, um, you know, project to work on. Can you tell us about how you were attached to this project and your experience with working with, you know, some of the communities that we don't really get to cast for or represent, which is the um, the South Asian community. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that? Well, I, I mean, I worked with the director on his first film called Miss India America, which was a comedy about a beauty pageant. And we saw loads of actors. We had lots of auditions for all the different beauty pageant contestants and the other characters. And so when this came along, this project, you know, it's nominated for micro budget and it was very, very small budget. So I think, you know, some of the cast came from seeing people from Miss India America. And then of course, you know, the director cast himself, his wife, who was also in Miss India America, their daughter, and a lot of it was actor friends. So this project was a real friends and family. Um, and, you know, I really just, I think they just kind of said, okay, can you, can you do all the deals for everybody? And then here are all the roles that we don't have friends for to fill in those roles. And then, and then during the process, some of the other people fell out and then substituting them. So it was, um, it was a little bit, a little bit of talking about all the actors that we we know, and I have worked on a number of South Asian films, so um, we knew a lot of the same actors. Can you tell us a little bit about, like, I mean, obviously it helps with working with the director that you worked with before, but in some of our experiences with this, there's a lot of education that also is involved. Like, we have to be educators. Now, you probably didn't have to do this with your director, but is there something that you wish that the industry knew about this community, you know, in your experience with casting them? I mean, there's, if there's, I don't think there's any, there was anything really different about casting this movie, but I think if, if people see the movie, it's about the Los Angeles South Asian community. And, um, and it's very funny and you know, kind of ridiculous too. So I think it's more the content of it and uh, the filmmakers making a film about people that, that they know. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you, Emily. Um, appreciate that. Um, Miss Denise, um, two extraordinary films and both very, very different. We have Elvis and we have Top Gun. Now, uh, to me, you know, I have the list continued with like the action-packed films that you've done. And then you also have something like Elvis, which is iconic. Can you tell me about how do you go from doing one thing so vastly different, both very, very epic from something that is music associated and iconic, and then doing something like Top Gun and reviving a classic. Tell me about that. How do you switch hats from one to the other? Well, I, you know, I think we always switch hats in every project that we do. And that's kind of what makes the process so terrifying in the beginning when you read a script. And, you know, I think I always feel like, oh, I can't do this. And I don't know what to do. And then you just, you just have to start. Um, so I, I think that for me, the process is always the same. And, um, you know, sometimes you have more or less experience in a field. Um, certainly with, with Elvis doing musicals was not my thing. And, um, 
so I had to do a lot of background research, you know, in terms of the other characters in the movie, which, you know, at the end of the day, we didn't end up using a lot of, we, we started out with one cast before COVID and we kind of ended up with another cast, which Nikki Barrett did so brilliantly in Australia after, you know, the lockdown. So, um, but in terms of especially Austin Butler, I had cast Top Gun before um, Elvis. And so I had seen Austin in that process and had actually shown him to Joe Kaczynski and to Tom um, when we were talking about who we were going to screen test for Top Gun and was so passionate about trying to include Austin, but ultimately they thought he was too young, which was a great thing for him because then he was free to do Elvis, which he would not have been, so. Isn't that incredible? You know how those things line up like that? Amazing, uh, yeah. Just yeah. And, and actually, you know, I think we all experience that, you know, from project to project, we get to know an actor who either is right or not right for whatever we're working on at the time. But, you know, having seen them through a series of different auditions, we, you know, we remember them for other things. We, we know then that they're right for something. There was something about the way that Austin had auditioned for Top Gun that made me think of him really first and foremost for Elvis, just mm -hmm. by the turn of his head, by the quality of his voice, you know, other things. So can we, can we emphasize a little bit on that? Because, you know, there's a lot of actors listening to us and actors, you know, who are listening in right now. You know, I think that a lot of you don't really understand um, how important this is that we as casting directors, we do keep you in mind. Like, even though if you weren't right for something, you know, maybe it doesn't mean that you were a bad actor, right? right. So Denise, can you emphasize a little bit about that? Like, you know, you do keep track on certain actors. You do keep tabs. Just, you know, tell us a little bit about that so our actors can understand that like, you know, you weren't a bad actor, but we will a thousand percent you know, keep your oh, mind. Absolutely. How, do you, how do you keep tabs? I, I think we all see people over and over again, you know, um, for everything that we do. And we also, you know, you can start out coming into our office for one line or two lines and you get the part. And then we want to bring you in for the next thing and the roles get, get bigger, you know, um, the more experience that you get or the more jobs you get. And then suddenly, you know, people are doing leading roles. So it, it is a process. It doesn't happen overnight in a lot of cases, in most cases, I would say, but we, that's what we do. We, we keep, you know, our lists or databases of all the actors that we've seen and that we like, and, you know, see them continuously. I'd say it's one, of, it's one of those things that is actually the joy of the job sometimes is being able to give people a job 10 years down the line. Yeah. You know, I've just done it recently. I've had an actor who's come in from almost everything I've done and never got the job. Not been bad, just not been particularly right for that role. And yeah. eventually got to give him a job. And it's really exciting because these people live with you um, for the entire time. Yeah, it's the best feeling, right? Yeah. And even, you know, and in some cases we have seen where an actor probably wasn't ready you know, and then we've seen them grow. We've seen them develop. You know, I remember, especially if you're on a series, I remember seeing somebody in the Fosters and Scott Jenkins was like, well, probably not right, but we want them to be good. You know, we really are rooting for them, you know? And, and then like six months later, we're like, let's let's bring them back and let's see, you know? And then like, oh, there was tremendous growth. Like the person committed to training and it was one, and they got a small part and it was amazing. You know that we were as kids, but like we do keep tabs. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody, you know, we this this does happen. Um, Victor, um, tell us a little bit about the transition from the old way of how we cast projects into the pandemic. Um, specifically, what was your biggest takeaway? You know, on how we're finding talent now? And has it opened any doors to how you view talent now? I think the 
there's always a big talk around self tape and getting back in the room and what that and what that's going to look like i think what the pandemic did was fast forward a process that was already happening mm-hmm. in terms of taping in terms of self tapes um and what it did actually i think for most of us we probably had two months we weren't doing anything and then suddenly things started happening again and it was um and it was through tapes now tapes allow us to see people from around the world i've been very lucky in my career where i've done a lot of international stuff uh, within europe and scandinavia or even shot here um which is used scandinavian european actors and it's exciting for us to find new talent be it american canadian um scandinavian whatever and it's it opens up the doors for me in london to get talent from around the world and vice versa for, for you guys in the states and and so it's um we understand that it's a blessing and a curse especially for actors we also understand that for actors who are already self-critical they're not used to spending so much time judging themselves and looking at themselves on tape and criticizing every little thing that they do and the mental impact of that um and i think we do understand that and we do want to be in the room and i think over here we are starting to more but the reality is that it's we've opened pandora's box she's out um and we can't shove her back in and nor should we because of the opportunity but it means that recall stage will do in the room but the wider searches will be tapes and it allows us just to give opportunity and we've had it with the with the agents over here where they're complaining that some of the older actors aren't quite getting the jobs anymore and don't send the tapes and it's just changing but equally and a smaller, you know, an actor with less experience from a smaller agency is now getting those jobs because they've now had the opportunities to tape for these things. And it's become a, it, it's a bit of a leveler, actually. And it was really interesting doing the, doing the bubble specifically, doing that with Gail Keller. So we're doing sort of, you know, again, we cast around the world. Um, you know, and Veer Das, he was an amazing uh, Indian comedian. Um, he... It was actually through Pashali, our assistant, who who spent some time in Mumbai, knew him, and um, and it just again he put himself on tape, and and I know he's you know has his specials on Netflix and 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 rep in the US, but it was the, being able to get him in his home in India taping for the tape to show Judd um, to then shoot in London during a pandemic. Um, it's it's um, yeah, I think it's just it's really opened up the field and i think the experience of not being in the room we all miss i don't think there's any question of that at all and it will and it will come back to it but in terms of the transition from from pre and post i think it's just sped up the process i don't think i think we were heading this way anyway yeah um and as i say i think that the takeaway that everyone needs to remember is that it's giving much more opportunity to much more people yeah yeah a thousand percent a thousand percent thank you um, Tiffany, mm-hmm. my lovely. So it's the same question, but I would like to add a little something to this. How do you ensure that you get the most out of an actress performance in this new way that we're doing things? Because there is still people get, you know, nervous that, you know, they don't get as we're giving opportunity to more people, but the opportunity to showcase what they could actually do. How do you ensure that you get the most out of an actor in this new process? Well, like Victor said, we were already using the process on some, I think because of the whole peak television thing, so many actors who were available for your project might be working elsewhere that limiting it to who's available to come in on a Tuesday at 1030 just wasn't wasn't really a reasonable way to do it. And what we learned is, you know, when you're not dealing with the time and space of a human being has to find parking, get into your spot at this time, and how many people can you actually see in a day for a project, especially for an episode of television, for example, when you have a, you know, time limit, it was kind of like, like Victor said, a leveler we could see so many more people and take chances and think outside the box and take bigger risks basically than we could when we know we need the part, you know, by Friday, we're going to bring in the people that we know will be able to book it as opposed to someone, a pitch or something like that. And so we were already using it. Um, I would say that now what I do is 
Um, one, if I'm going, both my shows happen to be shooting in New York right now. So when I have the opportunity to have in-person sessions, I take advantage of that because I recognize, especially as Victor said, some of the older actors who might not have as much experience with the technology, I don't want them disadvantaged and I want the best, you know, person for the job. So I try to create kind of a hybrid and actually offer the actor the opportunity the decision, do I prefer to come in the room or tape? Because some actors actually prefer to tape because they like the control element and also not traveling, not, you know, all of the negative stuff that kind of goes along with showing up anywhere outside your home. Um, And I also do use Zoom work sessions. So sometimes Zoom work sessions are not an ideal, like, casting, like it might not be the tape that I want to send to the team because of you know, we're reliant on both parties' internet, how it's working that day in terms of the tape quality. But often we'll do work sessions even if it's um, just to work with the actor and then they're going to self-tape after the work sessions. So we get like a casting quality tape, but they still get the benefit of um, working with with us. Um, or And we get the benefit of, of helping get that performance and helping make it clear for them. So we use a kind of a hybrid, I guess, is the way I would describe it. Um, and yeah, I think that's, I think we all want to get back in the room. I do think the reality of how much that process limits opportunity is going to be the next big question if we really go back in the room. Right. I really do think that this has, if anything, you know, has opened up ways for, for not just opportunities, but like for us to think about like, at least for me, my experience was a lot of my directors, you know, when somebody was shooting elsewhere, like, let's, let's get on Skype when Skype, mm-hmm. was thing, you know, and so, but then like, no, it's, it's not the same, but now that since we did it, there's really no excuse. And even for us as casting people, I could cast something in Hawaii, which I did, <laughs> by the way, you know, which is amazing. I could, you know, do it from my hotel in the balcony and I cast a feature film, you know, that way. So there's really no excuse for us not to see people. And it's really funny when we have an actor who's like, on set now and who's doing something and it's like well they're in you know North Carolina shooting something I'm like well are they working on aren't they off on Saturday can't we just get them on tape you know so there's really no excuses now so that's quite beautiful um I would like to know from each of you um the the number one question that is asked a lot but it's you know it's different for us all so I want to know what it means to you of what is it that you look for in a self tape? What makes an actor stand out? And again, this is a pretty loaded question, right? But for you, you know, what is it specifically? Because as we know, it goes by project to project basis, right? Sometimes we're looking for something specific. Sometimes we're looking for, you know, there's a certain criticia that they need to meet. For you, what is what is that one thing? And at what point do you know in that self tape if they're right or wrong? I think the most important thing in self-taping is preparation. Um, I appreciate when people are off book, when they've analyzed the material, when they know what the other actor is doing in addition to what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I want them to shoot it a certain way, which I usually all give instructions to you know every actor for self-taping so that it comes in the way I like to see it um and I you know I I like for people to have a point of view about the material and if and we also try to give people as much material as we can I, I know there's this big thing secrecy around all the scripts and it's so ridiculous a lot of the time because I think the more well-informed an actor is, the better his audition is going to be. Um, so we do try to provide them with that and um, have a point of view about the the material. And if you don't, if you're confused, then call call me. You know, we will generally speak to actors if they have questions about the material, and then. Personally, I I know pretty early on when I'm looking at a self tape if somebody is right or wrong. It um, there's a certain amount of gut instinct that we all have to go by, um, and I 
I continue to operate that way, whether it's in the room or on tape or, you know, whatever it is. So. Um, have there been any moments, because I understand what this, what this gut feeling is, I think a lot of us do understand this, this gut feeling. Have there been moments where you had a gut instinct at first? And so you're kind of like, okay, probably not the, you know, not the right one, but then it changed somewhere in the performance oh. and like changed your view. Can you, sure. how, how sure. did you, how did you tap in, lean into that and say, let's. You know, I think that happens a lot of different ways. Sometimes you just keep watching and, you know, something happens. Sometimes if I'm on the fence about somebody, I'll ask my associates to take a look at it and we all discuss it. And, you know, um, sometimes, you know, the I'll send something if I, you know, if I want to show somebody for context and if a producer or director likes them, I'll, I'll have a discussion with them about why they like them and or what maybe what my reservations are or vice versa, you know, they'll at, they'll be reserved, but I'll be sure and confident about the direction. So there's no formula, you know, casting is not math. It is based on a lot of different things and all those things come together, which is why it's good to have discussions with the director, you know, or the producer, if it's television about what it is you all think and see, not too many people. Unfortunately, these days we have too many layers yeah. of um, discussion and everybody on a production thinks they're a casting director. That's what they're the most interested in. It's kind of crazy. Um, but I think if we can do our work with one or two people who are key in making the decision, then for the most part, we come to the right decision about who should be cast. And that's the alchemy of what we do. And it is old fashioned alchemy, not, you know, not knowing the portions, you need to go and bit of this, bit of that, bit of this, bit of that. And it's, yeah. um, and I think in terms of the taste, that's when you start thinking about who you're going to bring in the room, because if they, you've seen something you like when they've had no direction and they go, okay, then let's, let's push them, see if they can be directed, see if they can do a different version of, of something. And I think the other thing the pandemic has done with tapes is it's slightly loosened the um, pressure on the presentation. Yeah. Certainly over here, I think we are very much, we're very much like, as long as we can see you, hear you, and you're clear, that's okay. You know, back in sort of five, six years ago, doing pilot season, um, we used to get it all the time. It's like, you need the gray screen, you need the blue screen, you need, you know, all this, they need to be mic'd up. That's kind of gone um a bit now because it is about who you're going to bring back in the room and i think it's it's taking the pressure off actors and now you still you know you still see it on twitter we're going it should it be this gray or this gray i'm like i don't care I just don't have any dirty washing in the background that's all i all i care about um also I think um, you can keep your pressure on models out of them. yeah exactly exactly yeah and also i think it's taken the pressure off of us also to make the perfect presentation at a casting session yeah. when you're asking a director to you know drive to your office and sit there for three hours now you know that they're watching you know these tapes in the very beginning and you know I'll take more of a chance to say this doesn't have to be perfect mm -hmm. um, let's just see what you think because we can be just as informed about a role and what it should ultimately be by what isn't right about an actor as what is right. Mm -hmm. And so it promotes discussion and that's what's important in coming to a final decision, I think. And sometimes it's just so obvious, you know, everybody loves the same person and somebody gives a fantastic read and it just happens. That's you know, the blaming the part. I always love that. Someone just, and I think it's yeah. something to just throw in here is I think because the actor is so focused on booking the part, like booking the part equals success equals good equals this. And I think people forget that we see a lot of good people and great auditions and one person still gets the part. Right. It's, yeah. it's not. So sometimes when people are looking for feedback, and I know it's frustrating to hear like it just went another way, but that is the correct feedback. Like I would never want to say to an actor who did a fantastic job and the job didn't go their way, 
make up something they did wrong or something the other person did better. These terms don't really, they're not a real good descriptor of what happens. Yeah. It's so arbitrary, isn't it? It's, all, it's always so arbit arbitrary when you can, the, the final choices are you've got five good actors. Mm -hmm. say about only one of them can gain the role and it's to do with who else is cast who things are so beyond their control and it's never anything to do with talent yeah yeah, oh, yeah. no we see a lot of talented people especially mm. if you're working on a competitive um series right you know if you're working on a huge mm. feature film with tons of movie stars you know you've got access to incredible talent across the board and so i think people need to give themselves a little bit of a break in that they probably did a good job mm. and that doesn't mean that they did something wrong or bad if it doesn't go their way or sometimes even if they don't get a call back they right. could still be great and i could still be sharing their self-tape with yeah. my entire staff going we need to keep look how great they're not right for this but keep them in mind for something else um no a thousand percent and, and that's what we were you know kind of getting into in the beginning is like don't take it personal guys you know mm. we keep tabs and sometimes even if it's not us you know the casting people you know, it may be the director, it may be the producer that was in the room, you know, it may be our, our intern, you know, back when, because I was an intern at Ronnie Eskel's office, right? And I still have some of those actors that I loved, yeah. you know, from, from then. And so it, it, it always matters. So yeah, give you, give you guys a, a little we bit. We don't have time to tell everybody, you almost got it. Right. <laughs> because we, we would be constantly doing that if we were able yeah. to tell everyone yeah. who did a great job or came really close. Yeah. Unless we see them again in another project, then I may say, hey, you almost got that movie two years ago or something. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. Emily, for you, at what, you know, what, at what point do you know, you know, when you're looking at a self-tape? I mean, I, 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 that's really hard to explain. Um, there's so many factors in it. But I did want to, um, I did want to mention something that's more, much more of a procedural or technical thing, which to actors, which is that, um, you know, when we put out a self-tape invitation and let's say we send it out, you know, on a Wednesday and the deadline is the following Monday, okay? Um, think about that, let's say the deadline's five o'clock on Monday and then all these self-tapes come in in the last hour. Well, in the meantime, you know, on Friday, on Saturday, on Sunday, you know, I'm looking because I can't watch all hundred or you know, 50 self-tape requests quickly enough. So sometimes I would really urge actors to get those self-tapes in early before the deadline, right. because those are the people that I'm probably gonna spend the most time watching and watch right away. And I, my client might already be wanting to see some, you know, some, some selections. Um, so especially for the games, because we, we do, I think, put out a larger amount of self-tape requests. Don't wait until the last minute. That's my bit of advice on that. Right. I want to jump in on this one, too, just because I have a slightly different perspective to just to show that it is always, you know, different. Because this is kind of the biggest question people will ask me is, should we get it in early? And going back to your original question to um, Denise what i we're looking for self tapes is good acting oh yeah right it's good acting and so i think sometimes the technical elements overwhelm and people forget about break down that script be a text detective and figure out the clues that are in the script and take mm -hmm. your time so in my office we have a system where our assistant gives us the link to, at the deadline so I actually don't watch and I'm it's kind of the opposite and I no judgment on it. It's just different ways to do it because I also want to encourage actors to prepare properly because for me, the acting and the point of view, de developing that point of view, developing a sense of relationship to the character is really important. And I, so I think that it's not something that they're like everything else. It's an art form and there's no rule of thumb. Yeah. I don't, right. I don't want people to rush either. And I always put, if you have any questions, mm -hmm. ask us. And if you need a debt, if you need an extension, we can give one. Right. And there, also, oftentimes people can't make the deadline. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I think actors should try to get as comfortable and proficient as at self-taping as possible because it's not going away. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's here to stay. It's directors like it, producers like it, especially for first auditions. Um, there's there's just no doubt that we can see more people, give more people opportunities, and that if if you if you get good at it, it just helps everything about your getting the job. And this is how we're going to ultimately see people is on the screen. So more and more, there there have been projects that I've done that have been totally off of self tapes. <laughs> where the director hasn't even met the actors. Um, so I, I, I think that as much as you can, and I know there's been a thing with SAG, like we can't ask people to memorize the material and that is certainly up to you, but uh, it's better if you do, and if you have the time to um, present yourself in the best possible way. That is so good. I think we can make t-shirts with everything that's been <laughs> said today, <laughs> our coffee mugs. Um, you know, and guys, like, you know, I think there's a, there's a big, you know, conception with, like, people being scared with the deadlines and stuff, you know, just so actors know, it's not like one morning Tiffany and Denise woke up and said, I want the deadline to be tomorrow because that's that. Like, no, like there's there's so many things that happen where it's like, a, it's, a, it's a director's deadline, it's a producer's deadline, but we as casting people want you to succeed and, and often defend you and often say, I'm trying to give them more time. So we are fighting on your side. So yes, we will grant you an extension if we can, but also don't abuse it because yeah. that does tend to happen. People ask, I need... I give one person an extension and everybody in the agency is asking for an extension, you know, so just be very, very mindful of that. Um, moving on here, um, something that's a, a very interesting question um, for credits, you know, for those actors that don't have a lot of credits, um, everybody will probably have a different answer, you know, as far as our credits are, are they important? But for those actors that don't have a lot of credits, what advice do you have for them to gain more experience or to showcase that they are good actors? I would say short films is a good way to go. And students sort of short films. If you're in New York, you've got a film school there, same in LA. Um, you know, I think it's worth just being aware, going on social, seeing what work is out there to hone your craft. And you don't have to pay, you know, it's not about spending money to hone your craft. It's about seeing what opportunities are out there for you to do that. I also think the um, self-taping, like the Scandinavians are amazing at it. They almost form little troops. They are. <laughs> um, and they kind of, they film, you know, they help each other and you get these short films. And sometimes that's a good thing and a bad thing. Sometimes the film the film outweighs the actor and that's the problem. Um, but it's, um, but it's, it's kind of help each other. I think that's a thing as a, as a community, your active friends, just, you know, treat it like a little project every time and, and see what you can get out of it to just get the experience. and. As I say, for me, I think short films, doing student short films, they might be shit. There's no other way of putting it in it. Um, but they might be brilliant, you know. Um, and you just don't know, and especially the student stuff, you don't know who knows someone who owns the company, who owns the cameras or the lights or the, or the you know, or, or whose who's parent someone is or whose auntie someone is and and what advice they're getting. And it's, um, I think you just got to play play the game sometimes of, of the risk of just trying these things. And seeing if there's something you might get something brilliant out of it. Yeah. One thing I suggest, um, you know, we all move to New York or LA because that is where the work is and stuff, but we're not, that used to be the case. I also think something that an actor can do if they're starting out and they really have no credits and no one wants to hear training in theater, but training in theater is where we find new talent a lot of the times is to go to a smaller market. Um, cause a lot of times New York or LA, they actually have rules in place and you should appreciate the SAG foundation that you can't see actors without credits because they're not union where if you are starting out and you don't have credits, you want to be seen a smaller market. Usually they're more open to waivers for people who are not in the union for their first professional employment. So I do think that that's an option that people can do, especially in America, we have Atlanta, we have Albuquerque, 
gosh, I feel like they did a tax credit in New Jersey now, Ohio, you know, things like this, you know, that you could get those couple of credits on big shows. And it's yeah. not as competitive as, you know, a place like LA, which is a town that is built on this industry. There's so much work in the States. And I think that it's opened us to like, there is, you, you know, I, I'm a Latina, you know, trans woman, and there's a lot of stuff coming out of Texas and, and New Mexico. Like who would have thought yeah. that, you know, that these states are creating, but there's a lot of Latinos out there that are creating content. And a lot of like a good friend of mine, Janine Masson was saying, you know, you could, for us Latinos, you could make a career out of this. You could be a production designer, a makeup artist and work in your backyard and work for Hollywood. And I get benefits, you know, as an actress. A lot of people don't know that. So that's quite incredible. So what I was what going on with this is like, I think that um, for some of us to do a lot of specified searches, like I do a lot of specified searches for like two spirit people, for the indigenous communities, for, for trans non-binary people. I do look at that training. I do look at community theater because a lot of the time these communities don't have the experience but I have to look at the basics did you do I'm asking did you do a school play did you do community theater you know a commercial I don't care if it's for YouTube or for yahoo.com whatever it is those things really matter guys so um, never underestimate you know those little experiences that definitely yeah. may get you in the room um on that note I want, would like to ask you guys about authenticity and diversity what have you uh this is from the audience how have you worked to make your casting choices be more inclusive? And what are some of the trends that you've been seeing towards anti-racist practices in the industry? That's from our audience. Well, I, I think we've all learned to be much more open to every ethnicity for all different kinds of roles. Uh, I think casting directors have been doing that for a long time. I mean, for those of us who are a little bit older, it started out with like, can't we make this role a woman? <laughs> that was kind of the first diversity, you know, play. And, you know, then it extended to, you know, black actors and Hispanic, and now it's really across the board. Um, and, you know, it, it's a lot more, work for all of us because every role can be everything and we really have to bring all of it together and it becomes like a painting of where we put people and what roles have what ethnicity and it, it, it's it's very complicated it takes you know a lot of um imagination and also getting people i think our directors and producers are much more open to it. And every real one realizes it really, it makes the project better and it makes it um, more accessible for people. I don't, we can't do it on every single thing. You know, there are certain things that, you know, whether you're talking about historical or whatever that call for a straight line, so to speak. But I think, um, it, it's just become the way we think. I don't really think we have to try too hard anymore to, yeah. you know, squeeze we, in. I agree with that. I think it's so it's much some... more support mm -hmm. right? uh, from the studios and the networks. And that I feel like used to be, uh, in my experience, kind of one of the harder things to face is presenting an actor who was um, diverse in some way and having them rejected by a student student because they felt like the snowing with the aunt you know like that i think we've really seen the chain of like a 180 on that which helps us with our directors and writers and also the writers rooms are more diverse and the directors are more diverse that's the thing it's about it's about the grassroots it's about the voices and that's the, that's the thing you've got to get the the people writing and i think often and you know historically it's a bunch of white middle class people who've been the writers and mm -hmm. they write what they know so, and I think as as Denise said, it's been our it's always our job to read through a script and go, why are 70%, 80%, 90% of these people, even incidental people, men? Why? And it's because and, you know, so you kind of go through, okay, that could be female. Um, what about this person? What about gender, sexuality? You know, it doesn't have to be about those things. We just got to think about putting those things in the show. 
Um, and that's the strongest, the strongest way of, I think, creating diversity and, and on screen is by by incidental and not necessarily making this character doesn't have to be this character because they happen to be black, gay, trans, you know, whatever. It's like they just happen to be and they're playing this character and it's not about that. Um, so you're kind of creating a world. So because I think often a lot of fear comes from the unknown. And people, you know, and a lot of phobias come from people who just literally don't know because they've never met anyone who, who, who. Um, and so it is our job to try and push productions. And we have had kickback from that historically. And I think, as as uh, Tiffany says, I think they're getting better. Productions are getting better at understanding it. Um, you know, I've had so many gross conversations with producers about people would be confused if we have two East Asian actors in a show because the audience would get confused. <laughs> and you're like, it's insane, Crazy. insane. Yeah. Um, and you know, but that is getting better and you're fighting that. I do think it's about getting the voices and, and the stories being told. So the commissioners need to make these things and, and the film companies need to make these stories to allow, you know, to force the hand. Um, so they have to uh, be so inclusive. Well, and one last thing, Candido, just because I think it's important, is so many of these shows, and, and this is the, the studio support I'm talking about, they're doing anti-bias training. We've had, mm-hmm. you know, wonderful um, town halls to talk about bias and, and, and communities that, um, you know, there's a big thing with, um, you know, trying to cast someone authentically. So if someone is of Japanese, if characters of Japanese descent, that the actor is of Japanese descent, but then having agents, you know, Asian agents confronting our ignorance saying, you don't know the history of this Asian actor, that this Asian actor could be a star in China playing Chinese roles accepted by the Chinese population and be of Korean descent. Or, you know, like we don't know these things. And I feel like that's the next big conversation is why is it only white people that are allowed to do an accent and do cultural research and play, you know, I did the film, the kitchen. Do you think anyone was asking if someone was of Irish American descent, but yet when we go into communities of color, I always say we ask where, I mean, we're, we don't actually ask because it's illegal, but you're supposed to expect to know where grandma is from. And it's you a little that, bit like, that's not fair to me you can, that's not fair to me we can have you can have to have the conversation i think and it's the same uh, uh, there's a big um thing here about also being um authentic about jewish representation as well on screen um and it's um you know i've had it recently on, on a show where a character was written as african sort of male and african descent but was but the actor playing with the caribbean and in the conversation with her was like do how do you feel about playing someone who's got African descent as opposed to um, a Caribbean. And, and, you know, she was totally fine with it, but, but not everyone is. But I think it's about having that conversation with the actors when you're doing that and making sure that we are aware that there is a conversation to be had. All right. Rather than blindly going forward. It, it, it is tricky, though, isn't it? Because, you know, it is acting. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, on, you can tear it apart, but on some level, it's like, not everything can be authentic yeah. uh, to the point where it's a documentary yeah. or, or we're making film, we're interpreting certain things. So I think it's, it's very complicated and every situation is different and every film we work on is different. Absolutely. And I think it's just more so about, you know, there's certain communities that um, haven't been given the chance, you know, haven't been necessarily had the opportunity because they didn't know that this was a thing. You know, a lot of my searches when I'm looking looking for my indigenous people, Latino or non-Latino, when I'm looking, you know, a film that was about Northern Cheyenne people, you know, I think it's our due diligence to try and to show that like, look, we, we absolutely a thousand percent, but one of my favorite uh, examples is uh, Francine Mazur Memoirs of a Geisha, you know, and so brilliant film. Michelle Yao, hello, you know, like, you know, I've known that she was a phenomenal actress since mm-hmm. Cratchit Tiger Hit and Dragon since, since her Jackie Chan movies, you know, but they, you know, her, Francine and Kathy Driscoll did a phenomenal job at searching for Japanese actresses, you know, they, they did bring in Japanese talent, they did try to find them, but in the end, it was just, 
you know, for whatever reasons, whatever factors were, like, it just makes sense to hire Zhang Ji and Michelle Yao and Gong Li right now. We're not at a point, you know, maybe now it's different. Maybe now we do have Japanese talent there, yeah. but they tried. They they genuinely did, but we just need to be more vocal that like we are absolutely a thousand percent trying. Well, and I also think there's such a mystery to the uh, to the casting process. People don't know exactly the lengths we go to, or what happens, or language barriers, or there there are so many different reasons why you may not end up casting as authentically as you would want to, or you started out trying to do. Um, and it, 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 it happens, you know, and ultimately we have a show or a movie to make and that's what we need to do. So, so true. I, we could never, we had this on a movie recently where, um, there was some controversy about it and it's like, you want to defend the process and explain what happened, especially when, you know, people are being kind of taken down on the internet and you want to tell, but the truth is the actors who you ultimately cast, that was their role and telling the story of the person who we wanted, but wasn't available or blah, blah, blah is hurtful to the artist who poured their heart and soul into that process. So Mm -hmm. it is like, it's really painful to not want to defend people, especially when you know, in your heart and soul, how inclusive those people are and how wonderful the, like, what those artists are doing for their community and to see them sort of taken down. But we all kind of know we're just trying to make the best stuff we can make and be inclusive. And at the end of the day, we can't explain everything. Right. And some of them require some magical experiences. I mean, like Zoot Suit and Luis Valdez. Mm -hmm. We need a Chicano actor to have a Pachuco enter Eddie James Almos delivering Mm -hmm. flowers. What about him? You know, and what happened, he was amazing. And then we created a legend. But to speak to the point of inclusion and diversity, how many other Eddie James almost do we have, you know, in that age range? How many Celia Cruces can we cast that are in that age range? But because there was no opportunity now, we see the big differences, especially within like the african-american community like we were starting to see a change and a difference but there are still certain communities that i feel that we could absolutely be made aware of you know i always have a little thing a little note every time i'm gonna wake up in the morning who was left behind yesterday okay and i and i look at it i need to look at more people with disabilities today I well, need to and look- you also see communities where people understand at a younger age that they can be actors you mm-hmm. know and and that's been a big problem in terms of really getting more diversity more choices you know you you see that maybe in the latino community younger kids don't have that awareness their parents are not saying oh you know you should do a play or whatever it's not a priority um so i think the more we can help you know, outreach to communities where kids do theater and um, they get involved in drama in school, things like that. It'll start to increase the options that we have of these people coming. When you go to cast older, um, you know, actors of any diversity, your, your pool is much thinner than it is now when we have so many young choices in those areas and that's really great because as those people rise up and get older you know i think we're all they're all very aware of representation how important representation is yes um to create Mm -hmm. to you know it's almost like for for the next generation of casting directors to then have more more choice um yes exactly yeah a thousand percent yeah Everyone, this has been a phenomenal conversation. It's been an absolute honor to have every single one of you here. You are all legends and so inspirational. And I thank you for the work that you do. And thank you so much for taking your time to speak with us here.